Dana Perino, of course, is co-host of America's Newsroom on Fox News. She joins me this morning. Good morning, Dana. How are you? Good morning. I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for joining me because I thought of all the people on broadcast news, the one who may have the most actual experience with dealing with Israel is you. And I wanted to go back and set the table by reminding people you were the 26th press secretary of the United States for President George W. Bush. Before that, you were deputy press secretary. How often did you get to go with the the former president to Israel, Dana? I went twice, actually, and we went twice in one year, or in a calendar year. Um, If you can go back in time, (laughs) you'll remember this, but just for your listeners um, who might not exactly remember, so Prime Minister Ulmer was the prime minister at the time, and I know this seems like a fantasy right now, but put yourself back in those times. There was a slight chance, a possibility, of an agreement on a two-state solution at the time between Prime Minister Ulmert and uh, Abbas, the president of uh, the Palestinian Authority. And it was really... Uh, I, 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 you know what, Hugh, I'm saying this out loud, and I'm thinking everyone's going to say that is impossible. There was never going to be a two-state solution. But at the time, that was the, the deal. And so it was a possibility. The president went there to encourage and to listen, but also he was there because there were a lot of things going on in the region, and I was there in that last year, and President Bush took very seriously his responsibility to hand off to President Obama the best situation he possibly could across the board, but terrorism and terrorist attacks was very much on his mind at the time, and of course Israel has been such an incredible partner for the Western world in order to help share intelligence to help prevent terrorist attacks. After October 7th, we know like, that doesn't always work. But yeah, I, it was. I think we should even go back further in time, Dana Perino, to uh, after 9 11, President Bush attempted to do a deal with um, Arafat. Arafat would subsequently yeah. die, but, but Arafat lied to him. And I believe W then said, I'm not dealing with that guy ever again. Have I got that correct from my memory? You are correct. And so after Arafat died, President Bush attempted to do a deal with Abbas before Hamas took over the Gaza. There was that brief moment in time. Israel's always been willing to go. And how optimistic was it on Air Force One that the two-state solution could actually happen? I would say just mildly optimistic, because one of the things that was happening at the time was Ulmer's government was very, um, I would say, unstable. There was always a threat of a new election being called because the coalition government was having a difficult time working together. I'll tell you my favorite story, though, of that Please. time, and it was about leadership. So we had heard, or I should say the president had heard, and then I was privy to, that there was one person on the cabinet who was very much against any deal that Olmert was going to make. And the president was invited to a dinner. We were all sitting there together. We are all eating dinner. And, you know, he didn't like to waste time or in idle chit-chat. So he just puts it out on the table and says, I understand that some of you here are against a deal. And I just want to step back. And let me ask you, how did you come to Israel? I'd love to know your story. What are your family history? How did you get here? And I remember the chief of staff for Omer looking at, for permission to speak. And he says, yes. Yeah. So he starts and he says, well, my family came from Iraq. And it was 1930s. Six, I think he said. And then the next one was Poland. The next one's Ukraine. Down at the other end of the table, another Israeli cabinet member leaned forward and said, wait, your dad came in po- from Poland in that year? That was when my dad came. And they had all these little small world connections as they do this for about half an hour. And it was very beautiful. And they had these moments where of unity. And the president said, I had a feeling you all had forgotten why you were here in the first place. And he huh. stood up, and we left. Huh. And well, it was a, a, he was a great diplomat. Try to get them to talk to each other. A lot of people underestimate how much the former president invested of his personal time in getting leaders to try and lead. Uh, I don't have anything like your experience, Dan, but, but he would invite talk show hosts in to meet with him occasionally. Maybe you were part of the reason that yep. that happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One time we came in, we were late. He kept us waiting for a half hour. Of course, you wait for the president. He apologized, which, of course, he doesn't have to do. But he had been on the phone with then Iraqi Prime Minister uh, Maliki, I think. And yeah, and had gone longer. And he began by saying, you know, it's my job to try and teach these people in new democracies how to lead. And so I'm sorry. And we went on with the meeting, but he invested a lot of time in it. But he the point is 
that both Sharon and then Omert and then before them, uh, Ehud Barak tried to get a two-state solution going at Y River with President Clinton. Then W tried to do it. Secretary Rice tried to do it. They tried again and again and again. And it doesn't work because the Palestinians never want the deal. At least that's my understanding of it. What's your understanding of it? I think that is absolutely true. And I, it's one of the reasons I feel so <clears throat> strongly about the coverage that we're doing here and the coverage that you're doing. I know that you and I follow each other on Twitter. We don't get a chance to talk all the time. But we have similar thinking about this moment for Israel is about their survival, the survival of the state of Israel. And you just have to look at what Shinwar, the head of Hamas, said over the weekend. He said, oh, you think October 7th was bad? He said, we'll keep doing it. We'll do it over and over and over again. And that is why Israel is determined to destroy Hamas. Hamas can never be, con uh, be allowed to continue. And yet, Hugh, I'm worried because I sit there and I read the coverage of what was happening over the weekend and the message that Kamala Harris was delivering, and I'm worried about America's position here. Let me, if I can, I want to play for the audience who may just be tuning in what the vice president said at COP28 in Dubai. Cut number 22. This is Vice President Harris yesterday, I believe. So I'm not going to reveal the, the details of the conversation, but I did speak with the emir and the um, work and their commitment to this work is ongoing, as is ours. And um, our work is ongoing to support some ability to reopen the pause um, and, and to, ha to have a deal going forward where there will be a pause so that we can get hostages out and get aid in. Now, uh, Dana, let me begin by saying there are two kinds of vice presidents, those that matter and those that don't. Vice President Cheney mattered a lot. And if he was giving a press conference, people would lean in and listen very closely. Am I right about that? 100 percent. And then there are vice presidents who don't matter at all. And that's Vice President Harris. And when she says she's talking to the emir, do you think the emir was leaning in and really giving close attention to what she had to say? I do, because I think that the vice president would never have said that on her own if she hadn't been encouraged to by either the president himself or the national security advisor. Uh, and I think that she does want to separate herself from Biden a little bit in terms of Biden ha having been pretty strongly supportive of Israel and the backlash that he's seen within his own party, especially on the progressive wing, I think she wants to try to distance from that a little bit. So if they encouraged her to say that out loud, I think she would have no problem saying that. Also, last week, she was asked at the Deal Book conference, what do you think about, do you think Israel is obeying the rules of war? And her answer wasn't yes, as it should have been, in my opinion. It was, well, there are many rules of war. Oh, I miss and that. I don't like the, <laughs> the shakiness <laughs> there at all. I, I miss that. I got to play for you the second quote from the vice president from yesterday, because this one's even worse. Cut number 23. Well, as I said, they, we have to revitalize the Palestinian Authority, which means giving the support that is necessary for good governance. Um, understanding that on the issues that must be resolved as we think of a plan for the day after, it is about good governance, which will bring transparency and accountability to the people of Gaza and the West Bank. Um, it's also about what we need to do to recognize there must be some plan for security for the region. And I suspect it, as, a, as a plan develops, it will take into account interim and then longer term. And finally, what we must do in terms of rebuilding uh, Gaza and a commitment to that. So, Dana Perino, what do you think that means? Well, I think that it means something along the lines of what Antony Blinken said in Israel last week, which is that the Biden administration does not believe Israel has the credit, that's their word, credit, in the geopolitical bank in order to do what it says it wants to do and needs to do, which is to eliminate Hamas. And it also means that she is going to be looking for regional actors to try to pitch in on some sort of aid package for Gaza, while Israel continues to sit there and say, we, we have suffered the worst terrorist attack of our, in our country's existence. We have to figure out how to protect ourselves immediately, and they need America's help. But I think my take on this, Hugh, is that 
they're moving forward, and they are trying to protect civilians. We know that. They are obeying the rules of war. No one else is. And she didn't ask anybody in the region to condemn what Hamas did. And the regional actors, they could have helped Gaza in the last 15 years, did they? No. So I think there's a lot of, mm, um, maybe, I, I don't want to say backsliding on the Biden administration because we haven't heard from the president, but in my experience, she never would have said that if she hadn't had the, didn't have the okay from the president himself. I'm going to come to Lloyd Austin in just a second, but um, I, I like enlisting the vice president to playing shoots and ladders. And whenever she gets asked a question, she goes down a chute to an <laughs> old collection of canards and cliches that she used to, two-state solution, Palestinian authority. And that if you pushed her, she wouldn't even be able to give you the list of prime ministers of Israel, much less their positions or the, when the withdrawal of Gaza occurred and how often they've offered and been told no. She wouldn't know what Y River is. I just don't think she knows anything, Dana. And maybe I'm being ungenerous, but I, I have a pretty good nose for people who know what they're talking about. I don't think she knows what she's talking about. You know, I would say, like, even for, for me, when I first started in the Bush administration, was actually at the Justice Department after 9-11. And I had, to, I had so much to learn, Hugh. And it takes a lot of time. And I, thankfully, I had wonderful people around me, like Steve Hadley, who guided me and helped me understand all sorts of these, all of the geopolitical issues that we're talking about today, I really learned about back then. And it was a, quite an investment of time and time that I needed to spend. I didn't learn enough in my university days about it. And part of this is learned experience. But imagine you're the vice president of the United States. And every single day you could call anybody in the government and have them come and give you a briefing on something because they're the experts. 43 used to do that all the time. He would just randomly say, could I get a briefing next week on what's happening in, you know, in Haiti? And sure enough, here they would come. And he would just always be curious. And I don't see that with her. I have a ton of curiosity every day I wake up, and I think I know less than the day before. So I feel like I'm always trying to catch up. Like, I'm trying to walk up that chute that she falls down when she answers a question. Yeah, this is why I listen to Dan Senor. I have five <laughs> podcasts I've started to listen to. Dan Senor, who I did not know much about, and you, you had to work with him when he was spokesperson oh, yes, for the Provisional yes. Authority. He's favorites. really smart. Mm. And, and one of the best communicators of our time, I think. I, I think his podcast is unique. He doesn't have to do this business because he's busy being an investment guy. But when he sits down with Aviv Redigur of the Times of Israel, I think that's the most important hour I get a week, and it comes out every Monday. I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to that yet. I listened Aviv, to about 40 minutes this morning before I came, came to work. Uh, you're, you're ahead of me then. Because Aviv, isn't he amazing? I've never heard of him until the last two months. Well, I started listening to the Dan Senor Call Me Back podcast several months ago, and I loved it because he would do one week of politics and the next week on foreign policy. And another person I would encourage everyone to follow, and I'm sure you do too, is a guest he had on named Richard Goldberg. And oh, I don't, I, I miss that. Oh, yeah, Richard hold, Goldberg. We all work hold, together in the Bush administration. He's great. Hold that through the break. I'm going to come back. I'm going to talk with Dana off the air, then come back with one more segment. She's being very generous with her time because we both believe that America's got to get smart about this. Israel's going to be in Gaza for months and months and months until the tunnels are destroyed and security is restored. And people have to start to prepare for that. And we've got anti-Semitism in Philadelphia. Lots to talk about with Dana Perino. Stay tuned. I'm back now with Dana Perino. This will air on my podcast, and I'll return to the on-air broadcast in just a minute. Dana, you're very generous towards successors as press secretary. I think probably you inherit that from former President Bush, yes. the same attitude. He never speaks ill. I don't want you to speak ill of Corrine Jean-Pierre. Mm -hmm. I just want to know if your deputy took the hard shots and the hard slots— in the way that Admiral Kirby is doing it for Corrine Jean-Pierre. They don't put her out in harm's way right now. Why is that? You know, um, John Kirby is, a ver is an excellent communicator. Yes. And I think that they're using their best tools. One of the things that a press secretary can do is say, look, I don't have all the answers, but I'll get you somebody who, can who does. And so in some ways, perhaps, she is saying, let me do the smart thing here and get him to do the briefing on these particular topics because perhaps she knows that there, there's a limitation there or that it's extremely frustrating for the people in the briefing room and those listening. The other thing is, Hugh, that I was never more recognized when, except for when I traveled as press secretary to South Korea and Israel. 
Why? Well, these are there were two states that were very concerned about their safety, South Korea because of the north and Israel because of the region and the concerns there. Because our allies listen to everything the White House says. So the press secretary briefing is very important. So I think that's one of the reasons they put John Kirby in there. I think that she would perhaps be better served by having a little bit more time with President Biden. I don't think she has a lot of it. I don't think he spends a lot of time with those people so that they're always sort of not quite sure what to say because you don't have time with him, so you don't know what to say. You know, I, I do want to pause on Admiral Kirby is extremely well prepared. Mm-hmm. And he is also by far the toughest on Hamas of all their spokespeople and of all their officials. I think he's got clarity that everybody else lacks. Have you noticed that? Yes, I believe he is a personally principled person. I also think that he and his deputy, Sabrina Singh at the Pentagon, continually have to figure out a way to get the administration back to where they need to be after the progressive left leaks something or says something that makes it look like the Biden administration is moving away from Israel. But I, but I believe that Admiral Kirby is determined to show there is no daylight between the United States and Israel. He would be better served if the vice president uh, agreed with him. And I don't huh. know if that's the case. I, I don't think the secretary of defense agrees with him. When we come back live on the radio, we'll talk about Secretary Austin. But I just don't recall a moment during eight years of President Bush when his press office was divided against itself. I, I just I just no. don't. And, and never, that never, ever happened. I would. But I will tell you one thing I really hated to do was brief about the budget. So in the weeks leading up to the budget, I would always start asking around, like, who would like to brief the White House for? <laughs> and, you know, they love to do it. So I would make sure I would have somebody. Like, I remember Rob Portman did it for me a couple of times, and I was so happy. <laughs> we come right back. We're going to talk about Secretary Austin. Stay by, stand by, America, on the podcast. Dana Perino is coming back on the broadcast right after this. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt, Dana Perino, of course, co-host of America's Newsroom. She's about to go off and be on the air. I really appreciate the time, Dana. You bet. I want to do two more things. First, in the Bush years, you had two national security advisors, future Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, and you mentioned uh, Mr. Hadley early, Stephen Hadley. I never saw Stephen Hadley that I can recall give a briefing. I don't believe I saw a lot of Secretary Rice before she was Secretary Rice. We've seen a lot of Jake Sullivan. Do you think that's different from when you were there? It, it was a very rare occasion when we had the National Security Advisor brief the press. Often it would be right before a foreign trip so that the National Security Advisor could say, this is where we're going, this is what we want to accomplish, and he would take some questions or, or she would. It, it was rare. And I understand, though, why they would want to have Admiral Kirby there. There was a lot of question about whether they would – whether Biden wanted to make him press secretary initially, right? Um, yes. Instead, they decided to go with Corinne Jean-Pierre. I think she's smart to lean on Kirby because he's got the knowledge and the experience. And I would say we're all better off for having him there because he's very principled. He seems to believe in his gut about what's right and wrong in this. You remember you saw the leaked commentary from President Bush when he was given a private event a few weeks ago. And... It was right after October 7th, and he said, there's a guilty party here, and it isn't Israel. And it's and 12, me, uh, you know, I, I applauded President Biden going to Israel. It was like mm-hmm. when President Bush showed up in Iraq on the first Thanksgiving that he did it. Mm-hmm. It's very important to do it. But I am very dumbfounded by Secretary Austin at the Reagan Defense Forum over the weekend, Dana. I don't know if you're going to cover that today. But it seems to me, Secretary Blinken, Secretary Austin, the vice president, everybody is putting pressure on Israel. And it's been two months since 1,200 Israelis were massacred and 240 kidnapped. And we have eight Americans held hostage and no one knows their names. Are you astonished by this as I am? I'm upset by it, like actually really upset. And I'm pretty even keeled, but this makes me extremely angry and nervous. I will tell you this. I don't think that that happened by accident. I think all of the administration people that came out this weekend to pressure Israel did it on purpose. And if it's not coming from the commander in chief, that would one be a concern. But I believe the administration is figuring out a way to try to tap the brakes here. And the only reason we got to a hostage release is because the Israeli military put so much pressure on Hamas that they basically cried uncle and said, we need a few days. 
Okay, my last question, Dana. Last night, there was a mob outside of a Jewish deli, or at least a deli owned by a Jewish American who might also be an Israeli American, uh, at, at called Goldie's. And the mob was 100 strong, and it was very threatening. Governor Shapiro, Democrat, has denounced it. Uh, uh, Dave McCormick, who will be the next senator from Pennsylvania, if things go well, denounced it. I have not seen anything from the White House. What would W have done if an anti-Semitic mob showed up in the streets of Philadelphia uh, intimidating, harassing, and threatening a Jewish American citizen? You know, it's, it's so shocking that you think, well, I can't imagine that we have gotten to this place. I don't exactly know what President Bush would have done, but he would have been in touch with the governor indeed. And the other thing is, though, he, last night they decided not to do a menorah lighting. I believe it was in Richmond, Virginia, because it might upset some people. Yes. Right. So yeah. when I talked to Dan Senor on the podcast, I do. One of the things that shocked me was when he said, for the first time in my life, I feel vulnerable. I don't want my friends. I don't want any Jews to feel that way. I don't want any Muslims to feel that way. Uh, but I don't think that the White House's anti-Semitism movement is actually bearing any fruit. And they need to do something more to do that. Let's close by reminding people Richard Goldberg's pot. I have not heard of it, so I want to know about it. What's the name of it? Uh, so, so Richard Goldberg is a part of the Foundations for the Defense of Democracy, FDD. You can find him there. He is an incredible person, but he was a guest on the Dan Senor podcast okay. several months ago talking about how the administration was trying to do another deal with Iran, and that really got my attention. So I started following Rich Goldberg, and he's a wonderful follow on X, formerly, formerly known as Twitter, and somebody who Dan has had on the podcast a lot. And we've, we wanted to have him last week, but, you know, People, it's flu and it's cold and flu season, Hugh. I don't know if yep. you've had guests dropping like flies, but uh, the, the fetching Mrs. Hewitt out. has been completely ill for a week, and all the grandkids are completely ill. So you're right about that. Guests do drop like flies. Dana, you didn't. I appreciate your joining me so much. Off to America's newsroom with you. The only morning show worth watching. If you've got cable on in your home, go watch Dana and Bill Hemmer. And tell Bill congratulations. The Red Hawks won the MAC. I don't know if you know that, Dana, but you can surprise him by telling him Oh, my him gosh. That. The Red Hawks won the what? The, the Mid-America Conference. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're big. They're very, very proud of that. They had a big celebration in Oxford, Ohio. So you can surprise them when you see them this morning. Dana Perino of America's Newsroom, thank you so much.